session in our series on care of pediatric and adult patients. Um, oxygen therapy in children is what we will be discussing this evening. We have a fantastic uh, panel um, ahead, of, ahead um, of you right now. Dr. Sarah Miller Stroud is here, um, anesthesiology, perioperative, and pain medicine, Stanford Global Anesthesia. P uh, Dr. R.J. Ramamurthy, pediatric anesthesiology, Stanford University. Dr. Anna Maria Crawford, anesthesiology and critical care medicine, Stanford Global Anesthesia. Dr. Becky Wong, pedi pediatric obstetric and adult anesthesiology, Stanford University. And Ms. Debbie Lester, global health and international development specialist. Before we get started, I just want to run through a few of our Project ECHO etiquette guidelines. Project ECHO is based on a foundation of love and respect. Please respond kindly rather than react if you disagree. It is everybody's responsibility to keep ECHO a safe space. Please test your equipment ahead of time. Uh, we will be using the chat function for questions and answers. There's a chat button at the bottom of your screen. So please send all questions through the chat box and feel free to introduce yourselves. Uh, there is interpretation this evening. The interpretation option can be found on the bottom of your screen uh, for Khmer, which we sh hopefully will have available uh, shortly in the next few minutes. Please choose the Chinese option and for Vietnamese, which is currently available, please choose the Spanish op option. We apologize, um, Zoom does not yet have those languages as options. Um, please position your webcam effectively to show your face if alone or to capture the whole group. And if you have any IT issues, please send a message th through the chat um, to us and we will try to help you out. Again, if you are, um, or sorry, if you are uh, gathering together, please practice physical distancing. Um, we are trying to be mindful of infection prevention and control um, in these times. I'm now going to pass it along to Dr. Stroud to get us started. <laughs> It said see, um, you know, see. Well, it just said see. Yeah. Can't. Go on to the next section, which is delivery of oxygen in pediatric patients. In this video, we will talk about the delivery of oxygen for neonates in children. Clinical signs of hypoxemia in infants and children include central cyanosis, nasal flaring, the inability to drink or feed, grunting, lethargy or drowsiness, chest wall retractions, tachypnea, and head bobbing. Nasal prongs can be used in both children and adults. Usually flow is limited to one to four liters per minute for children and infants, and one to five liters per minute for adults. The fraction of inspired oxygen and you'll delivered. You'll see on these screens that it offers the standard flow rates and how you would place it. If anyone wants me to stop at any point or you have any questions or comments, please let me know. With these flow rates, ranges between 28% to 40%. Steps for placement of nasal prongs in infants and children include first ensuring the appropriate size. Second, placing the nasal prongs just inside the nostrils, then securing with tape. Next, set standard flow rates one to four liters per minute. And last, monitor the SpO2. Providers must note no humidification is needed with low flows, and there's no risk of gastric insufflation with these normal flows. Nasopharyngeal catheters are another oxygen delivery system for infants and children. The flow for nasopharyngeal catheter ranges from 1 to 2 liters per minute, and the FiO2 ranges from 45% to 60%. 
The first step for placement of a nasopharyngeal catheter in an infant or a child is to measure the distance from the child's nostril to the tragus of the ear or the inner margin of the eyebrow. Next, insert a 6 French or 8 French catheter to the distance marked by the previous measurement. Third, set the flow rate at 1 to 2 liters per minute. And fourth, check for mucus obstruction and clean the catheter twice per day. With these low flows, no humidification is needed. If a nasopharyngeal catheter is unavailable, a nasogastric tube can be used if the tip is removed. Maximum flow is 4 to 5 liters per minute. This table illustrates the standard flow rates for neonates, infants, and children, where the flow of 0.5 to 1 liters per minute is used for neonates, 1 to 2 liters per minute for infants, and 1 to 4 liters per minute for children. Higher flow rates require humidification to avoid drying of nasal mucosa. Oxygen masks provide another means for delivering oxygen to children and infants. The steps for placement involve first ensuring appropriate size that's placed over the child's mouth and nose. Two elastic side straps can be used to tighten the mask to the child's face. Standard flow rates are from 6 to 10 liters per minute, and SpO2 should be monitored throughout. The fraction of inspired oxygen delivered with these flow rates ranges from 44% to 60%. A head box or oxygen tent can deliver oxygen without risk of airway obstruction or gastric insufflation. Exact FiO2 must be measured by placing an oxygen analyzer close to the child's mouth. To avoid carbon dioxide accumulation and potential toxicity, recommended flows are at least 2 to 3 liters per kilogram per minute. Does anyone have any questions about that video? I noticed some of the questions uh, that were sent in the email previously that we got um, said, what are some methods of, that you can use to avoid mechanical intubation? So that video just went over some ways that we avoid mechanical ventilation in pediatric patients. And I wanted to know if any of the panelists wanted to elaborate in how they avoid actual intubation in pediatric patients. I think early recognition and intervention is the key for you know avoiding intubation and mechanical ventilation. And definitely in low research settings, the key is to recognize early and intervene early. Whatever the, the technique that we just described, these are pretty easy to apply for most places using nasal cannula and you know uh, pharyngeal cannulas. You can often uh, you know, get over the crisis before before things start to go downhill. Dr. Ramamurthy, is it common for you to use an oxygen hood? I think the key in oxygenation is not just the delivery system. It, it's also equally important is patient acceptance. Whatever technique you use, the patient should be able to willing to cooperate and maintain the same level of our comfort or even decrease uh, you know, uh, anxiety and irritability to improve the success of delivery system. The delivery system alone is not going to you know, increase oxygenation, it's patient cooperation. So it's important to use a system that the child will cooperate with. Oxygen tents, oxygen boxes, though can deliver higher oxygenation, can be very kind of intimidating or 
for the child and often interfere with, you know, a, a clinical uh, examination and access to the head and neck if, in case of, you know, immediate need to access to. So it's important to start, I mean, nasal cannula is often very well tolerated to, you know, to just say the least. So often that's, that's the key. First thing is early recognition and nasal cannula. And the rest of the things will, based on whatever setup you are at. I was just gonna add too, um, for other tips for our um, clinicians is that even in the early newborn period, especially for a baby who's just delivered, and a lot of our settings we see maybe some lower birth weights, is that things um, such as warmth is really important because you know if, when we get hypothermic with these low birth weight babies that have, um, you know, that lose a lot of um, heat easily through their um, very thin sort of skin layers. And so just kind of making sure that you um, kind of look at methods that provide warmth and when they're um, low birth weight or premature, their heads are even extremely floppy, even more so than a newborn. So kind of really looking at your positioning and just kind of some of those, as we, as, uh, we were saying, just very, very sort of simple interventions can have um, you know, very large impact. I think also in um, what we're seeing in the neonatal population is um, not as much mechanical ventilation as maybe we um, had done probably in the previous decade or so. So CPAP, if we had to go to more, um, you know, moving on from a nasal cannula and kind of going to CPAP, that was kind of what we had typically sort of was our um, top line intervention years ago. And we're seeing kind of a, a uh, backtracking back to that in the neonatal population and, and seeing um, favorable outcomes without sort of um, often the, you know, the trauma that you'll see with mechanical ventilation, some of the long-term damage. So I think, you know, with the COVID-19, we're hearing a lot about ventilators and the need for ventilators, but I think just to rest assured that you can have um, very good outcomes without having, using mechanical ventilation. Okay, we can go to the next discussion. It's a case discussion. Well, there are um, there are a couple of questions, so you can answer these on your own time or in the text uh, in the chat box. What is a normal SpO2, and what are the factors and considerations for determining a normal SpO2? Okay, we can go to the next question. Mary brings her 10 month old child to your clinic. The infant has an SpO2 of 92% and has central cyanosis. Does she need oxygen? You can type your replies in the text box. Does one of the panelists want to answer what you would do? Okay. 
Okay, so I can um, speak a little bit to that. So an infant who comes in um, at 10 months old with a oxygen saturation of 92 with central cyanosis, that's not necessarily normal. And so I would want to ask the mother a bit more about the history, whether there was an upper respiratory infection that um, the child has, any other uh, sick contacts that they've had, or if this child has any other um, past medical history, even in their short um, lifespan of 10 months. But at this point, you, I would be concerned about the central cyanosis and the low oxygen saturation. And what type of oxygen would be your first choice in this patient, just from what you know? Um, if it was just purely oxygen, I'd probably want to kind of check a physical exam, listen for any kind of wheezing or any kind of obstruction, perhaps. But otherwise, um, I would probably try some blow-by oxygen. Hopefully, that will be a better well-tolerated, or if the child will tolerate nasal cannula. That's probably what I would go for. Okay. Great, thanks. We'll start the next video and the more questions you guys can do. Let's discuss a case of hypoxemia pediatric in a pediatric hypoxemia. patient. Let's Mary brought her child to the emergency department after she developed fast breathing and grunting for 24 hours. On examination, the child is tachypnic and has chest retractions. Her oxygen saturation is 89%. Does this child need oxygen? Yes. Where pulse oximetry is available, saturation less than 90% is an indication to start oxygen therapy. What if the child's SpO2 is 92% but she has central cyanosis? Does she need oxygen then? Yes, despite an oxygen saturation of 92%, central cyanosis is a clinical sign of hypoxemia and oxygen therapy should be started. What if you do not have a pulse oximeter, but the child is grunting? When would you start oxygen? A grunting child needs oxygen. Indications for oxygen administration include central cyanosis, nasal flaring, failure to feed, lethargy, and grunting. These are all clinical signs of hypoxemia. How would you deliver the oxygen therapy? Oxygen therapy can start with nasal prongs at 1 to 2 liters per minute flow or through the use of a nasopharyngeal catheter. If the patient's condition worsens or saturation remains less than 90%, flows can be increased up to 4 liters per minute. Let you deliver oxygen to Mary's baby using a nasal cannula at 4 liters per minute flow. On pulse oximeter, the SpO2 reads 89%. What will you do next? If nasal prongs and catheters used at max flow of 4 liters per minute fail to alleviate the child's hypoxemia, use of a face mask, which can use higher flow rates greater than 4 liters per minute, should be used to target an oxygen saturation that is greater than or equal to 94%. If the face mask fails to correct the hypoxemia, then a qualified physician should be alerted immediately, as positive pressure or more invasive means of ventilation may be necessary, such as CPAP, bag valve mask ventilation, or mechanical ventilation. Let you decide to place a simple face mask on the baby at eight liters per minute flow. Her SpO2 rises to 94%. How will you know when to increase, decrease, or stop the oxygen therapy? Pediatric patients require strict monitoring. The most appropriate monitor for oxygen is pulse oximetry. Oxygen is a therapy and should be prescribed and monitored by several parameters. 
the oxygen delivery system, such as prongs, catheter, mask, or CPAP should be noted. Oxygen flow rates should be noted, remembering higher flows will require humidification. Monitoring systems for adequate oxygenation include clinical signs, SpO2, and blood gas analysis. The frequency of monitoring should also be established. Depending on severity of illness and stability of vital signs, frequency may range from minutes to hours to once or twice per day. Bedside nurses and providers should have clear instructions on when to report abnormal values. Quickly alerting physicians for dangerous vital signs can ensure timely and safe care for patients who are deteriorating. Knowing when to make changes to the oxygen delivery device is also key for bedside providers and nurses. Values of SpO2 can be used to titrate oxygen flows up or down depending on the patient's status. Finally, knowing when to stop oxygen therapy is key. When patients are doing well on low flows with SpO2 values greater than 90%, they should be assessed at least once per day off oxygen for 10 to 15 minutes, evaluating if the therapy is still needed. If the SpO2 is greater than 90% after a trial on room air, the patient should remain off oxygen, and the SpO2 should be rechecked after one hour as late desaturation can sometimes occur. If severe hypoxemia, which is an SpO2 less than 80, apnea, or severe respiratory distress occurs, the child should be immediately restarted on oxygen. Children should not be discharged until SpO2 is stable at greater than 90% while breathing room air for at least 24 hours until all danger signs have resolved. So does one of you wanna discuss, um, we had multiple questions about this that were answered actually in that video, but one of the things that wasn't addressed in the video that people had questions about was the use of nebulizers in pediatric patients. So let's say you had the patient initially come in and the oxygen saturation was 89% as it said in the video. At what point do you use a nebulizer? What's, what's the role in nebulizers in pediatric patients? The nebulizers are mainly for drug delivery and usually for, you know, if you, if you enter, you know, sitting symptoms of croup, uh, then you may want to consider using medication like racemic epi or if you have bronchial asthma, you want to give some albuterol as a nebulizer. Uh, usually, a nebulizer are not preferred method of oxygen delivery. You know, as you, as we just saw, oxygen needs to be used like a drug. You don't want to overdo it. You just want to do right amount of oxygen. Devices. then can cause trauma, you know, uh, damage to the lungs. So it's important to understand the concept of using oxygen as a drug. One common question about oxygen, you just mentioned that using nebulizers could potentially deliver too much oxygen. Um, can we discuss the complications and problems with hyperoxia or too much oxygen? Um, some of the things that come to mind with excessive amounts of oxygen is, for example, in um, premature neonates who can have oxygen toxicity, especially retinopathy of prematurity. So that's one of the concerns. Um, also patients with, for example, cyanotic heart disease or potentially problems where 
an excessive amount of oxygen may kind of flood their lungs or cause um, extra pulmonary circulation, which may be detrimental to them. Someone asked, what are the risks of home-based oxygen therapy for children? Are you likely to send many of your patients home on oxygen? I would just say it's probably not very common. Um, and when it is, when it does occur, requires a lot of planning and additional equipment. Typically home oxygen is delivered using an oxygen concentrator or an oxygen cylinder as the supply source. So oxygen um, availability is one thing to consider. Um, the delivery mechanism is typically through nasal prongs. Um, having oxygen, nasal prongs, or mask limits the patient's mobility. Also, in small children, they may not be able to keep the oxygen delivery device on if they are moving around. Um, oxygen is incredibly flammable. Um, and so having oxygen near fire sources, um, near gas, gas heating elements or stoves, near smoking um, or any sort of ignition source is a very um, serious concern with home oxygen use. Um, additionally, as Dr. Wong mentioned, delivering, and Dr. Omamurthy, delivering too much oxygen can cause complications in certain young patients. So having a lot of education and training to the caregivers or care providers in the home environment is necessary for patients to receive oxygen at home safely. Okay, we can go on to the next video. Pediatric patients who do not improve with other non-invasive oxygen delivery systems may benefit from CPAP or continuous positive airway pressure. All images and information can be found in the WHO Oxygen Therapy for Children publication, which is linked to the Learning Resource Center online. CPAP is indicated in spontaneously breathing patients in respiratory distress. CPAP uses positive pressure, which keeps airways open, decreases atelectasis, improves oxygenation, and decreases the work of breathing. When patients fail to improve with oxygen delivery using nasopharyngeal catheters, nasal cannula, or face mask, then CPAP may be an effective option of respiratory support. CPAP is not advised in patients with nasal or facial fractures as pneumocephalus may result. Similarly, CPAP should be avoided in patients with pneumothorax as the air cavity can expand under positive pressure. In patients with severe respiratory distress or severe hypoxemia, CPAP may not be enough support and invasive means of mechanical ventilatory support should be considered. If pre-made purchased CPAP devices are not available, a simple bubble CPAP can be assembled using readily available supplies. Providers should become familiar with their own local resources and understand what- So these are all of the supplies that you need in order to make this bubble CPAP 
So you can review this and see if you could possibly make this within your facility. Oxygen delivery devices are available for their patients. Simple bubble CPAP setup requires an oxygen supply, whether pipeline, cylinder, or concentrator, a flow meter, humidifier attached to the oxygen source, a simple nasal cannula of appropriate size, a clamp such as a surgical hemostat, sterile water in a bottle, a ruler for measuring centimeters, and gauze or tape to secure the device to the patient's head and face. A key learning point is that oxygen in high concentrations can be toxic to neonates born at less than 32 weeks of gestation. High oxygen delivery can lead to retinopathy of prematurity. Therefore, an oxygen air blender must be used with bubble CPAP. The steps in the setup of a simple bubble CPAP are as follows. First, cut one side of a nasal cannula tubing. Two, clamp the short end of the cut segment. Number three, connect the end of the oxygen tubing to a humidified oxygen source and flow meter. Number four, immerse the long end of the cut segment into sterile water at the desired CPAP depth measured in centimeters of water. Number five, begin oxygen flow at five liters per minute. Number six, attach the nasal cannula to the patient, ensuring a good seal in the nostrils. And number seven, look for bubbles in the water bottle to confirm CPAP is being delivered. Another key learning point is that bubbles in the water bottle must be able to escape the bottle to avoid buildup of pressure. Providers must not occlude the top of the water bottle for any reason. Maintaining the bubble CPAP safely includes changing the sterile water daily to prevent infections and cleaning the and I have a question for the panelists. If you were making this bubble CPAP, would you use it in a COVID patient? And then would you be able to reuse those supplies in the following patient, in a new patient? I would answer that you uh, could potentially use this in a COVID patient if you um, felt that this was indicated, if you felt that um, the patient needed some kind of advanced form of respiratory support, but you definitely would not be reusing um, any of your supplies um, from patient to patient. Perfect, thanks. Nasal cannula at least one time per shift to prevent occlusion by secretions. If bubbles are not seen in the water bottle, then CPAP is not being delivered to the patient. Providers must know how to troubleshoot the apparatus to prevent injury to the patient and to ensure adequate breathing support. Providers must ensure flows are at least five liters per minute, that all connections are tight fitting, and that there is a good fit or seal of the cannula at the nostrils. If positive pressure is being lost by the patient breathing through their mouth, then providers can consider using a chin strap to ensure nose breathing resumes and positive pressure is maintained. Bubble CPAP is not without complications. Complications include rebreathing of carbon dioxide with low flows or obstruction of the exhalation limb. It is important to always verify and reconfirm bubbles are in the water bottle. Gastric insufflation can occur from the positive pressure generated by the system. This can be particularly concerning when using a chin strap as vomiting and subsequent aspiration are possible. Providers must closely monitor all patients on CPAP and have increased vigilance when a chin strap is in place.
the cannula is stiff, is not secured well and moves frequently, or is the wrong size for the patient. Pneumothorax can occur or worsen with positive pressure, so providers must continuously reassess their patient's breathing patterns and bilateral breath sounds. Excess secretions do occur when initiating bubble CPAP, but should decrease or subside by four to six hours. Bedside providers must be sure to clean the nasal cannula and ensure it is free from obstructing secretions. So I know, Debbie, that you've used this a lot. Um, can you talk about how easy it is to create this um, and what type of outcomes you got in the patients that you used it in? Sure. And all what I could do is give a couple tips if that will help others as well in the use of the kind of homemade bubble CPAP um, kits. I think it's, you know, it is important. Um, we um, know that we've looked at a lot of different kits that different um, health centers have had and um, sometimes with, you know, the goodwill that we have and we're given kits that they, you know, that we would have to be careful that they are um, assembled correctly. And that's why the WHO kind of put out this sort of guide because we realized that a lot of, um, you know, well-intentioned uh, innovations weren't actually delivering bubble CPAP. And so you can, you know, be really um, stuck with kind of not obviously getting the outcomes or the progress that you're hoping for. So I would say, you know, really kind of doing a really diligent equipment check when you're building your system and, and doing your best to kind of, um, depending on whatever setup that you're using, making sure that you're using um, pieces that kind of go together within a kit and, and um, or if not, you know, defaulting to the WHO um, device. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, always, you know, there's some good troubleshooting checklists and different things that you can look at if you're having trouble with your bubble CPAP. So for example, if you're not seeing your bubbles, you know, before you put the CPAP on your patient, you can occlude those nasal cannulas and look for ver really good bubbling within the system. So you wouldn't want to put it on your patient until you assure that. Um, and as the video indicated, um, you know, really good vigilance to, um, you know, maybe suctioning and checking for secretions and looking for occlusion and monitoring for, um, you know, you know, improve respiratory function. Um, we talked a little bit about retinopathy of prematurity and what that is, um, um, and is really just in um, premature babies, the blood vessels in their eyes are immature. And so with a high level of oxygen for a consistent period of time, it, it becomes toxic. And those little immature vessels sort of leak or rupture, and that leads to varying degrees of blindness. So we know that um, a real vigilance to their oxygen saturations is very important. And if we can keep um, premature infants under 32 weeks, 30 weeks-ish, um, maybe saturating in the high 80s to low 90s, that's actually preferable so that we don't have them say saturate, oxygen saturations at 100% consistently so that we can try and prevent any disability from these therapies. I think another couple tips is that if you're not seeing the um, the impact that you had hoped for is that oftentimes air can escape into, um, into the stomach. And so what we'll do is we'll put an orogastric tube down. And if you're used to using feeding tubes on um, infants or newborns or children, when you're doing kind of a, a, a gastric deflation, you'd want to use a slightly bigger uh, catheter size than you would normally use to feed an infant. And you can put it, uh, it down, you can try and aspirate and, and decrease any, you know, uh, draw any air out and, uh, and just take the tube to the chin. And you can also uh, measure an abdominal girth if you want to look at a baseline and just sort of see where, what the abdominal girth is when you've started CPAP. So if you feel like you're not really getting the results that you hope for, you can kind of watch for abdominal distension as well. Um, 
And another thing just to think about in terms of the different kinds of tapes that we're using is just that we've also um, seen a lot of skin that gets scarred from the tapes as well and the tapes being pulled off, especially when you're looking at low birth weight infants. So sometimes you can put a piece of tape on each cheek as a barrier and then you can kind of retape over top of that if that makes sense. So that if you're feeling with CPAP that you're trying to get that really good seal and you keep kind of retaping to get the cannula on snugly, then you're not always kind of ripping the tape off of the cheeks and it kind of just helps preserve the integrity of the skin. Um, and we usually start, um, you know, when you put your, when you insert your CPAP, your, um, or your tube down into your, your bubble or your bottle of water, a good starting point is usually about five centimeters. So just as a little tip um, and, and then sort of see where you go from there. And I'll probably stop there and I can um, see if there's any questions in the chat as well. How, how often, I have a question if it's okay. How often would you change the water in the water bottle um, in which the tube is inserted? a good question. We really recommend uh, changing it every 24 hours. And there is a recipe where you can put a little bit of acetic acid in if you want to put it in your distilled water, or if you don't have access to clean um, or dis distilled or sterile water, then you can add that to your water as well. And I can make sure that we, um, I think we have that in one of the learning um, modules, but we'll make sure we have that. But every 24 hours would be ideal. We have a link link to the safe bubble CPAP YouTube video. Does it mention it there? I, I'm not sure if it does, but I'll make sure that we, because we looked at that, we knew that a lot of um, different uh, health centers were having maybe some challenges in getting some of the sterile or distilled water. And so uh, the respiratory therapist kind of came up with a, a good equation of when we can put some um, acetic acid in and then, and then help to kind of keep the water as clean as possible. And I'll make sure we get that in there if not. Thank you. I can play that YouTube video if you want me to. Um, I think it just talks about the air blender if I'm yeah, it was um, yeah, it was a it was a blender that's used with a bubble C one one type of bubble CPAP device. And so these extra resources that we're talking about are just further down under this um, series three session, so they're available to everyone. We have articles on retinopathy of prematurity and other specific uh, articles for pediatric patients. So I'm just going to, um, we've completed the formal series. I'm just going to ask uh, the panelists some of our questions that we received um, beforehand. Some of them we've already answered, so I'll just skip over those. What is the relationship between oxygen therapy and respiratory drive? I would say it's an inverse relation. The more oxygen will cause uh, uh, you know, suppression of the respiratory drive. The hypoxia is a very good drive for respiratory drive. So this is the reason you don't want to achieve 100% oxygen all the time. So some, you know, if you have less than 92% saturation, you sustain oxygenation and also maintain the drive to keep, for the child to keep breathing. And do you have different parameters for different ages of patients? You know, your neonate versus your five-year-old. What are your oxygen saturation goals? Just roughly. I think the, the main changes are the respiratory rate and depth. That's that's a critical to know what the individual respiratory day, rate and depth for a given child. And with respect to oxygenation, it's pretty much standard across the board. As long as you sustain saturation above 92, uh, provided there is no other contributing congenital heart disease or mixing lesions uh, that, could, uh, that could aggravate the pulmonary flow and reverse the you know, shunt 
and you should be okay to keep the saturation above 92 across different ages. Is that true also? I apologize, I'm an adult uh, anesthesiologist and intensivist. Is that true also immediately after birth? I seem to remember that it often takes a few minutes to hours for the saturation to reach 90% or above. Is Am I remembering correctly or? Uh, no, okay. no I, was, I was gonna say, yeah. So I would say for the vast majority, like what Dr. Ramamurthy was saying, um, for the oxygen saturation, you can apply that to most babies. But Dr. Crawford is correct in that um, freshly born neonates, they do often appear a little cyanotic, like peripherally cyanotic, and their oxygen saturations do take um, hours to come up to a what you would consider more of a normal oxygen saturation. And then also to add to the evaluation of a child is also the tachypnea. So a newborn or a neonate can have respiratory rates in 30s or 40s and that's considered normal, whereas that would be abnormal for say a five-year-old that you would expect their respiratory rate to be more like 20s, 30s. One, one of the questions um, in, that, in that same discussion was how long would you administer oxygen? Um, I know what my answer would be for an adult patient, but how do you monitor your patient to see if they still need oxygen? Well, until, until the very first sign of clinical recovery, and then you had to start to titrate down faster, as you probably saw in the earlier video that you, you may want to have a period of disconnection, uh, uh, discontinuing the oxygen to reassess the child if the child is continuing to need oxygen. So this is as important to uh, ramping up the oxygen therapy, it's also important to ramping down as soon as possible and knowing that there is oxygen is a drug and it can cause toxic effects. The other little tip I was gonna say, I was thinking about as you were talking about um, in the initial newborn period is um, often uh, newborns will have kind of bluish feet you know, or their, or their hands. And so just knowing that it takes a while for the circulation to kind of reach you know, the, the extremities, so you're really, really looking at their central sort of color and that when you're doing an assessment because having a little bluish tinge to the feet for a little bit after delivery um, can be normal. Um, also that there is a, um, in some newborns, they present with what we call transient tachypnea. And so that's again, you know, something that you're monitoring and for various reasons um, that will often um, subside with, you know, time with warmth and good positioning and your, and your monitoring. And, you know, often at times you'll have to give a little bit of oxygen, but, um, you know, that will subside. So you will kind of see that. And sometimes we see it a little more with cesarean sections, um, but it, um, it's, uh, it's something that we see, I would say it's, it's not uncommon. And so we've talked a lot about, um, non-invasive ventilation as being a preferred method. So when do you go just straight for mechanical ventilation and um, is COVID changing your view for pediatric patients for non-invasive ventilation versus invasive ventilation? I would still go with the non-invasive ventilation as a primary choice of therapy for even COVID patients. The best way to manage is put all the COVID patients together. And I know non-invasive has a higher, chance, higher risk of aerosolization. So maintain standard infection control measures, the PPE and everything. So, uh, and group all the kids together that will have a similar kind of clinical picture so they can you can sustain the same level of care and and monitoring needed. And the goal is to avoid going towards 
mechanical ventilation if possible. I know in adult patients, um, once we decide that we need more than an oxygen mask um, or a nasal prong, we will move to either high flow nasal cannula or what we typically call non-invasive um, ventilation such as CPAP or BiPAP. Um, high flow nasal cannula is not the same as nasal cannula at high flow. It requires a, a very specific nasal cannula and, and separate machine to deliver that. Is that often used in your patients? In pediatric patients? Yes, uh, high flow nasal cannula again is uh, one of the very good uh, alternative for non invasive ventilation. So, as you rightly said, it is not just a flow, it is a humidification that kind of is a key to make sure that you can deliver high flows. And normally we set up at two liters per kilo, that's our flow we set up at. And that really helps with uh, sustaining oxygenation. It also provides a certain amount of CPAP, just the sheer high flows. But also that because you're delivering very high flows, you have a very high chance of uh, uh, gastric insufflation and possible complications of pneumothorax and things like that. So you really need to monitor the child closely and you probably have to have a means of deflating the stomach. And so you, your, your rule of thumb is two, two liters per kilogram. Is that correct? That is correct. That is correct. Yeah. And then also to answer your question, Dr. Crawford, is that we do also have like CPAP, nasal CPAP for children as well. One of the questions is, is oxygen therapy in children compulsory for COVID-19 patients? Um, I think, yeah, go ahead, sorry. I guess I'm not really sure about whether it's, uh, what it means by compulsory. compulsory. Um, certainly some children may do just fine and never need to have, some children with COVID-19 may be just fine without needing any oxygen therapy. But my understanding is that um, children and maybe even adults can present very late um, with not having that need for, like not feeling that tachypnea, but yet having very low oxygen saturations, so can present with very low oxygen saturations, at which point I think the clinical scenario will dictate that perhaps the patient does need oxygen. Perfect. Do you guys have any other questions, participants? You can type anything in the text in the chat box for us. We've covered all the material uh, for this session. So now we're just any additional questions. Since I'm an adult um, person, I just wanted to ask the pediatric specialists um, what have been their personal experiences with COVID-19 in the pediatric population um, have you seen a lot of respiratory distress in your patients? Um, have you seen um, the muscle weakness and neurologic symptoms? Have you seen other symptoms maybe that we haven't read about? Um, and what, what's, what are the big um, messages that you have about COVID-19 in, in pediatric patients? I would like to Becky Wong and so that she's our COVID lead. <laughs> Um, so I'll give the caveat that I am an operating room anesthesiologist, so I uh, see mostly children who come in for procedures and surgeries. So uh, we often have the luxury of being able to postpone um, surgeries than if they were to come into, for example, the pediatric intensive care unit with specifically COVID symptoms, whatever they might be. I will say that in our perioperative arena, we have seen patients who have come in that are very much asymptomatic. 
and who have been noted to have um, a positive COVID test and, and not even known it. Um, the other day I took care of a patient who is just six months old and had already in a short lifetime been positive for COVID-19 after the whole family had become infected. Now this patient did not have seem to have any long lasting sequelae, only had very mild symptoms um, of just like a normal kind of respiratory infection. Um, whereas the grandmother, for example, was much worse off, but everyone, all the other younger children and the rest of the family um, seem to just have kind of mild symptoms. And um, Anna, I did ask the question as well to colleagues um, at Seattle Children's to just, you know, asking them kind of just in more recent days, kind of what were they seeing? And, and it was the same even early on, but um, kind of the same sort of thing that they weren't seeing kind of as severe um, they were ready for that because we didn't know what it was going to look like initially, but a lot of times, yeah, with family members that were positive that were a lot sicker and then had children that needed kind of varying degrees, but of more of what we call mild sort of oxygen therapy. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining. Oh, we did, we did a good question. Is there a specific time limit for one to decide that the oxygen saturation is not picking up and thus change to another method such as mechanical ventilation? Maybe I'll start this one just to say that, you know, often with um, with your pulse oximetry, if I'm reading this correctly, is that you can, sometimes it can be hard to get a reading. So you really want to make sure that you're um, checking your equipment and your um, saturation probe and that you've got a good placing. So if a child's, um, you know, finger or foot or wherever you have the probe attached just is um, cool, then you'll have trouble picking up. Um, you know, a reading, or if you don't have, depending on what type of saturation monitor you have, if you don't have the, the probe lights that are um, communicating with each other, uh, depending on what kind of device you have, then you'll have trouble kind of picking up a reading as well. So we often just really making sure that your equipment, you know, is um, working and then obviously assessing the, all the other respiratory parameters as well before uh, maybe, um, looking at just the saturation piece, we're looking at the whole clinical picture. And I'll defer to my, the expertise of my colleagues, but. I just want to reiterate that it's a clinical, overall clinical picture that's going to decide on mechanical self-evaluation, not just one parameter. And as you rightly said, that you know, it's important to look at the whole child and decide on the need of mechanical ventilation, not just the timing it takes to get a good oxygen saturation signal. So I, I think that question can actually be interpreted a couple ways that pick, picking up means that maybe the pulse oximeter is not getting a proper read. And so you don't know if the reading on the pulse oximetry machine is correct or not. I think also oxygen saturation is not picking up could mean that perhaps the oxygen saturation is not improving with um, the oxygen delivery device that's currently being utilized. So if, if it's the latter interpretation of that question, um, moving quickly from one oxygen delivery device to another oxygen delivery device that can deliver a higher percentage of inhaled or fraction of inspired oxygen delivery is really important. So it's, it's, it pivots on whether or not the bedside provider can detect the clinical signs of respiratory distress and respiratory extremis. So if the patient is very tachypneic, if the patient is lethargic, if the patient is having retractions around the neck and the sternum and the ribs and doing a lot of abdominal breathing, or the chest wall is not expanding at all, that patient is in 
in severe respiratory distress. So you wanted to choose a, a oxygen delivery device that not only supports oxygenation, but also would decrease that patient's work of breathing. So that would be a device that would also probably deliver pressure to assist with ventilation. So those devices are gonna be your high flow nasal cannula to some extent, but probably more likely your non-invasive CPAP or BiPAP mask, if that is available. If that's available and being used and the patient is still having very poor oxygenation, super high work of breathing, then that's when you would consider um, uh, mechanical ventilation with an, through an invasive means such as intubation. Um, but, but you need to understand the oxygen saturation limitations, the pulse oximeter limitations, and I think that one needs to understand how to detect clinical signs and symptoms of mild respiratory distress, moderate respiratory distress, and then severe respiratory distress because the response is going to be different. There are two really wonderful tools on the Learning Resource Center that help bedside providers triage patients into the appropriate oxygen delivery device. One is from Lifebox. It's called the Lifebox Triage Tool. The other, and it's in multiple languages, the other is um, the Oxygen Wall Chart. And both of those will tell you how to um, use the pulse oximeter to evaluate the patient um, and the patient's oxygen saturation, but it will also help you decide how much oxygen can be delivered through this, the various oxygen delivery devices, whether it's nasal prongs, simple mask, mask with a reservoir bag, venturi mask, um, et cetera. So, it, or uh, the nasopharyngeal catheter in, in small children. So those things are available to you on the Learning Resource Center and, and should be helpful in deciding the level of oxygen supplementation each patient uh, would require. And we'll also go over that life box triage set next Monday or Tuesday for Southeast Asia. So it looks like um, the next question was, do you need an arterial oxygen level or is it possible pulse oximeter enough, and a pulse oximeter sir, is often enough for early decision making in managing hypoxemia in children. There's actually, um, if I may continue talking, um, there is, the pulse oximeter is, is definitely enough. There's, there's a severe limitation in access to arterial blood gas analysis in many, many places. So getting an arterial sample for gas analysis is not always possible. The pulse oximeter is a measure of the arterial saturation in that it requires the pulse and only the arterial blood is pulsatile in most situations. So that it is a, a good estimate of how um, the saturation of oxygen in arterial blood. There's actually a Kigali modification um, for the definition of ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome that actually uses the pulse oximeter to define ARDS um, in situations in which arterial blood gas analysis is unavailable. So pulse oximeters are your best tool to evaluate arterial oxygen saturation in most settings. And a, and a rough rule of thumb, you can assume that at the saturation of 90, your PaO2 is around 60. And at the saturation of 92, your PaO2 is close to 80. So you can probably take that as a kind of indicator, but you, know, you don't really need to be measuring PaO2. But I know PaO2 is a key factor in delivering oxygen to the, to the tissues. But I think pulse oximeter often is not. Do we have any other questions? OK, 
Okay, thank you everyone for joining us and we hope to see you next week at the same time. And we'll be talking about oxygen therapy in adults. Thank you so much, um, all of our panelists. This, uh, this was really great. We really, really appreciate your time um, and your uh, expertise. Um, we didn't unfortunately have the um, Khmer interpretation this evening, so we will have it recorded in the next day or so. So uh, the recording will be available for anyone who wants it um, in the follow-up email that we send out in the next few days. And I would just like to point out that we do have a WhatsApp group that we continue, um, that we use to continue the conversation, the dialogue throughout um, the weeks uh, in between sessions. So please uh, join and just, you know, link through the QR code here or email us um, at echo at assistinternational.org. Thank you again to the panelists. As Dr. Stroud mentioned, we will be here again same time next week. Um, so please, please join us um, to learn more.